Welcome to episode 90, similar to one of the Carmudgeon Show. I'm Derek Tam hyphen Scott. This is Jason Camisa. And I'm, just, I'm having fun <laughs> lip syncing to what you're doing. <laughs> and this episode is about valves, valve train, camshaft, valve timing, launch estrados, V6s, um, V12s, V12s, W12s, t- V10s. Um, yeah. I think it's no time. W10s, W8s, w- W8s, diesel or gas, W12s. Yeah, those carburetors, are fuel injection, uh, engines. Engines. I guess we're talking about engines. All about engines. Today is all about engines and breathing deeply. Also, 5,252, which is a constant that you really should know. Yes, the importance of 5252. Which is different than 5150, <laughs> especially in California, which is the code under which you are put on a cycle. The psychiatric yeah. hold yeah. Yeah. due to so a psychiatric emergency. if you 50 someone, you put yeah. them in a 72-hour 72 72 cycle. Yes. All right. I, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to 5150 <laughs> Derek. Now, because we are now clinically day. insane. Uh, uh, but, but yes, okay. thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, thanks to the Haggerty Podcast Network. Look at you. I'm, uh, uh, we've checked all of the boxes. Not, not all of them, because I'm, I'm going to do it this time. Well, that was totally effortless and free of drama. You should clap from now on. No. Hello and welcome. Are you John Davis? No. You I don't know what I bet John Davis could do. <laughs> clap. Yeah. Well, um, we've just seen me do that. We don't have to see amazing. me do that now. Uh, okay. So we are, God, it's very strange to be without headphones. I know, I don't, uh, we're trying, we're trying an experiment to see if we, if we're less weird. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's probably the headphones. That's why we're weird. That's of course having nothing to do with the fact that this, this week we're going to be talking about camshafts, valves, bore and stroke and whatever else. Oh, Paula forgot to hit record on the cameras. What? (laughs) He had the A cam going. That's God, it doesn't matter. We don't need close ups on us. Um... First things first, uh, this past week, we crossed over a million views on YouTube uh, for the Carmichael Show. And metrics on... Oh, damn it. I knew you were going to answer this question. <laughs> Give me data. Uh, no, I'm mostly interested, actually, in what percentage of our consumption is online versus listen. It used to be almost like large por- portions were on YouTube, but now yeah, like a lot of people listen. Used to be. No, not, it's not anymore. Um now you're going to make me do research. No, no, no. I, point I, I'm, out that I no, haven't done my homework. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. Anyway, a million, oh, a million watches, uh, but a lot of people apparently listen to us. And then I was going to say that inserts are maybe largely <laughs> irrelevant. Then I think for the people who watch us, it matters. But if mo- most people are listening and not I watching, mean, then... you know, most of the people that I know watch us, w- w- watch us on YouTube, say they sort of have it on in the background. There's nothing really all that exciting to watch here, um, yes. other than you know my occasional dirty looks that I give you. Um, but uh, the inserts help. I think they really do help provide perspective because a lot of people don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> that's story of my life. I um, have to add inserts to my own life. That's a good idea. You should have inserts, inserts for, for my for my own life when I. I mean, I sort of do that because I remember when photos. Yeah. Ha- like when I took a photo of something, so I can usually pull it up on relatively short. So, notice. by the way, YouTube is now considerably less than half. Yeah, um, that was yeah, my understanding. The, there was one at the last podcast I looked at was 22,000 out of 54,000 uh, streams. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, those of you on YouTube, you are now in the minority. Um, but keep, we will keep, keep shrinking. So, th- well, I'll come up with a full number. Maybe by, you know, at some point, maybe by the end of the year, I'll have compiled 2022's <laughs> data finally, which I keep saying I'm going to do and then never get a chance to. Uh, but obviously, we're. At well, listeners right. don't really care. I mean, Whatever, it's just self-congratulatory. Keep... Listen, if there's any advertisers out there, if you want to advertise on us, well, you know. We're, oh, we we're could start doing that. Yeah. <laughs> then we'd have to read things like brought to you by Snapple, lemon tea, naturally flavored. And also maybe we should be sponsored by Kleenex because I have to sneeze. Yeah. It's not a great brand fit. What? Kleenex? Kleenex? Why? I don't know. I mean, I would I would be more enthusiastic to talk about here's insurance. Some, here's some lotion. <laughs> All we need is tissues. Kleenex. Uh. <laughs> for fuck's sake all right so the t- topic of this week what are we I love it when i get we, Derek to we, say um, like honda has just made a new v6 oh yes so the so someone in the comments you were like one v6 ever made by honda and it's as old as the sands of time or whatever the phrase is that you used but then you uh, someone in, older than dirt someone in the, uh newer than dirt right 
Uh, no, I think it predates dirt. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it's uh, sand casting. Sand is before dirt. No, Honda. Honda has had. So the same someone in the comments was like, "Yes, there's a new one." There which, is apparently a new one. Now let me, let me make it clear: the original NSX had its own bespoke V6, but Honda's other other passenger car V6 has been the same for. 25 years i don't even i can't remember when the hell that thing came out um uh, but probably it, in the legend in 86 86 86 um and that was a single overhead cam uh originally was it it must have been two valve per cylinder originally it was as of late was a single cam 24 valve uh straight six but uh v6. did have v tech v6 so, oh god why do we do this we come we eat here lunch because we would die if we didn't eat. Yeah, but we're we'd far more fun if we were, weren't half dead. We're always like food coma after lunch, and we can't can't speak English anymore. Anyway, so it's a twenty four valve V six, but it's single cam, so two camshafts in total, one per bank with VTEC, and that's been existing for a very long time. Honda now has a new turbo V six. That's a double overhead cam, uh, turbocharged V six. That's an Acura TLX. Um, also a turbocharged V six in the NSX, but. Honda has moved uh, their three and a half liter uh, V6 and has killed off the VTEC. No more really? VTEC, yo. Oh, I mean, the V6 crew is not really a VTEC demographic anyway. You don't think Accord manual V6 buyers were cared about the... I love that changeover. I think that Integra buyers were more invested in that and S2000 buyers yeah. and RSX buyers. I'm trying to be Here's the thing. It was a good V6. It had a really good long run. Um, but VTEC has been replaced with just cam phasing. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the benefit of VTEC was that you could have two very different cam profiles and it could switch cam profiles. And that V6 was able to switch cam profiles even with only one camshaft for that was operating both intake and exhaust valves. Um, and I think it would switch the intake. So I, I, didn't, I haven't done any research on this, but I'm sure it was switching the intake cam lobes. But what the new motor can do when you have an independent camshaft driving intake valves and another one driving exhaust, you can change, you can phase timing. So you can change intake uh, timing. Um, and now the new motor has four phasers on it. So it can change intake and exhaust uh, timing. Dramatic improvements in efficiency. Yeah, gain no horsepower. I mean, so this is the thing is, we... Emissions. You know, it's emissions. Improvements it was, in emissions. It had to have been emissions that drove that decision. Either that or either. I haven't looked either. Maybe it's probably... If I had to guess, it's the TLX is three liter with head design just without the turbos. So move to direct injection. And I'm sure it was there for fuel economy and emissions. Although mm -hmm. I don't believe it actually got a big bump in fuel economy. Um, which speaks to the inherent goodness of the of the old engine. Um, but there was a time where many cams meant many more power. Yes. And now we're going to go back to your expertise. So uh, 1800s, um, yes. when the first variable valve timing <laughs> was invented. <laughs> and it was just because there was a guy there going bang, bang, banging on the top of the intake valve, opening it to keep the engine running. Yes, the early ones were... Well, so yeah, I mean... Overhead cams initially was quite a big deal because we take it for granted effectively at this point that that's how the, the where the camshaft will be relative to the cylinders. Unless uh, you're driving a Corvette. Uh, overhead cams, though. Um, yeah, so overhead valves. Sorry, let's go back okay. to overhead valves. I meant right. overhead valves. Because initially you would have, you know, the, well, there was Voisin did sleeve valves. Um, which is why they were so smoky. So it doesn't have valves that you would recognize as valves. It has more like these port things and there's two concentric sort of cylinder liner thingies and there's holes in them and they m rotate. Um, anyway, that's <laughs> that's the voisin approach. But yeah, a lot of the, the time French the, approach, the, val yeah. the valves would be not overhead as well as the cams not being overhead. Uh, and then of course you, the air has to make like a U-turn if it's doing that and that's quite inefficient. Uh, and so the earliest, we did like 64 seconds of research, which is an infinite percent increase in the amount of research we normally do before a Carmagen episode. D but you that learned... That is to say another way of saying, let's spin this on a positive note, we just know a lot of shit and we don't have to do research. Yes, <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> or we just are totally fine making ourselves look like assholes. Um, yeah. Those are not mutually exclusive. True. Uh, so you learned that the f the first uh, f multi valve overhead cam engine was the 1912 Peugeot. I told you this Grand Prix car, something something, which was was news to me because we th when we think about multi valve technology as a car enthusiast, a mainstream consumer of 
car materials, you usually associate multi-valvage with what decade? I mean, so I think what I, I I'll go back and and talk to what what it, what it appeared to be is that there were a collection of cars throughout history that had double overhead cams and four valves per cylinder, but almost all of them were racing derived. It was. So, you know, the first sort of production one was the Nissan Skyline, the, the Hakosuka GTR that had the Prince S20 motor in it. That was a twin cam four valve per cylinder, um, two liter straight six that wound up in the also the the Z432. Yeah. Um, one of the best sounding engines both of us have ever heard. 1968, 69, somewhere in there mm -hmm. uh, production. That was incredibly early. But that was another one of the examples that had been that had peppered back to the 19 teens yes where you'd see racing engines that were would wind up in road cars and that was peugeot had done one yes and he's he sort of fraschini also in that one. era um bentley's from the outset always had four valves per cylinder uh but they, were they twin cam they were single cam with four i don't valves. know if they were twin cam or not they probably were single cam uh so that was uh, you know 1921 and these are the cars that won them all bugatti would do that as well um the other one that i think is pretty neat is the duesenberg model uh j and sj which is the supercharged version of that engine it was an inline eight with four valves per cylinder and twin overhead cams and in like a big luxury car i mean that and the engine was designed by uh harry miller i think was his first name oh harry yes um <laughs> harry miller uh who designed indy car engines and i think he maybe did some stuff at offenhauser but anyway he designed the engine and that's why it was like a racing engine even though the car was a big luxury car uh and that's why it had that level of sophistication but you know for every one of those there's all these people who are doing you know not even overhead valves mm -hmm. in, in luxury cars so it, that was like a sort of philosophical place to be for various expensive car makers and then meanwhile pedestrian cars were still doing sort of side valves and stuff like that and you know if you were lucky overhead valves with with push rods yes if you were lucky um, yeah and so it really there was there was another car oh there was a uh, a ford cosworth that was or no i'm sorry it's cosworth vega that was yes all in 1970s so 70s is sort of when you started to see jensen healy less early. less insanely race engines that wound up being uh four valve per cylinder but i really it, when you when you sort of look at the scatter plot of where they all existed it really was 1980 to 1983 where 80 to 86 when everyone really came online and it was actually uh, everyone meaning like just sort of premium brands that were doing performance not, oriented cars i mean not they, even premium but if you had a, and toyota yeah but if you had a car that had 16 valves or, or, or you know or twin cam mm -hmm. you know that was something that got put on the outside of a car and be like that's the sporty one right and there's kind of a long period in here where you could buy both variants, mm -hmm. you know, like the Saturn, the first Saturns were like this, and there's all these cars. We're not there yet. We're, we're at 1980. Yes, right. We're going to go about this chronologically, God damn it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> we flew right through my era of expertise in that case. Well, and I, I think it's important to look back and say, you know, like Ferrari 1982 models got quattro valvole. So they were the four For valve the eight cylinders, cylinders right? yeah. The, and those were, those V8s had already been twin cam, but they were twin cam. Yes. Um, Single, uh, two valve per cylinder motors. Um, in 1982, Ferrari introduced that the, the four valve V8. But by that point, Nissan and Toyota had both introduced four cylinder 16 valves uh, mm -hmm. models. And so they're really kind of the, the earliest, right? So Nissan, again, 1968, 69, 70 in that area with, with the S20 motor. And that really was once on the forefront. Honda was nowhere to be seen from, from what I know. Um, but really that was the spark. And then 83, you started getting... Um, uh, so 85 was Countach, 85 was Mercedes-Benz with 190 to We also uh, skipped BMW. BMW is another race engine. That was another yes. one that I put on that other scatter plot of that M88, which is the engine sure. from the M1. Mm -hmm. um, that was a fully developed the race engine. As was the S14. As was the S14. You um, could argue the same about the uh, Mercedes engine, though, as well. The 2360? Yes. That, that it got a that it caught a Cosworth head intended for making for racing. homologating for yeah. to go racing, yeah. but we saw Saab in '83 put uh, 16 valve heads on their cars, yeah. and then from there on it was Volkswagen '80 '86 um, and GM '87 with that the quad, quad four, four. Um, and that's I'm really interested the to experience one of those engines. I've never driven a quad four powered car. I hear they're like kind of weirdly torquey and strong and uh, coarse. 
the I re- everything I read in period was that it was you know, it hauled they made crazy power, but they were vib- vibro monsters and just terrible. I've never experienced one either. Hmm. Um, the Saturn ones were were not that. The Saturn had that one point nine liter that was not related to the Quad Four, but that was about the same time. Saturn came out in nineteen ninety, right? Ninety ninety one, yeah. Um, and so they were that was a one point nine liter, and you could choose between a single overhead cam eight valve. Uh, and a double over cam 16 valve in the SL1 yes. and SL2. And SL2 yes, SL2 two for two cams. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, Volkswagen 80 in 1986 and a half, the Scirocco 16 valve came out. You could still get a Scirocco, and that was an eight valve. Um, ditto with, you know, GTI that next year, GTI and GTI 16 valve. Um, and there were plenty of other cars where you could get the 16 valve variant of it. Right. And that was the higher performance. Right. And it was uh, the way that you would see displacement changes or cylinder count changes historically. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they would just do it with valve train. Yeah. So it was like very cutting edge stuff during that era, despite the fact that t- technology had been around since the dawn of uh, automotive time almost. What you saw in almost in every single case was, this was like free money, right? So you think in the mid 1980s that we're just coming out of the fuel crisis into the Malay and Malays era, mm-hmm. right? Now all of a sudden you have this technology that costs absolutely nothing in fuel economy, but gains, you typically saw 40% power gains, mm-hmm. which is like fucking unbelievable for, you know, for, that was just power that was left on the table because these engines couldn't breathe at high RPM. Yeah, so maybe we should uh, sort of tr- transfer gears a little bit into the the technical specifics of why this is beneficial. I mean, the fundamentals of having more valves being better is that if you imagine the ceiling of a combustion chamber, if there's two valves, then they account for only a certain amount of percentage of that ceiling. And if you have four valves, you can use more of that available space for moving gases. Yep. So two, that, the, the surface area or the opening area of two small valves is far greater than one large valve. Um, and that's just because per, of the, for intake right, and for exhaust. exhaust. Yes. So you know to go to, from one intake valve to two intake valves, um, you can you typically see 30, 40, 50 percent increases in flow, which means that power, much, power, that much more fuel air mixture, and that much uh, more quickly moving. Yep. Uh, so yes, that is a, one of the benefits as well. Um, it seems such a simple thing, but. Um, you know, car companies did, the French started, I, th- I think they were, it was a Peugeot again that also had a five valve, three cam motor in 19. Thank God whatever. we never did that again. Jesus Christ. But I mean, look, think of all the car companies that did have five valve engines. Yes. That was all um, the rage for a while. In the early 1990s. Ferrari F355, 360 also had yeah. a five valve. Uh, Audi motor. did it a bunch too, into that, the 2000s. Yeah. 1.8. So the Volkswagen Audi Group 1.8 turbo and the, um, and the V6s and the got V6s it. Well. And the V8s, I think. And the V8s and the V10s. Really? Um, yeah, they were, I'm pretty sure. I mean, look, But not with three cams. Not with three camshafts, no. Yeah. Um, don't forget that car companies typically def- make one combustion chamber design and then just hit control C, control V, 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 V. Right. As required it, to get to the de- desired number yeah. of cylinders. Um, not unlike, oh God, I shouldn't even say his name because after I've some recent episode, everyone's like, where's the Piech episode? But during the era of maximum Piech, I always admired the fact that you could get any number of cylinders in any configuration with any type of fuel. From the Volkswagen Group? From the Volkswagen Group. If you look in the right place, right? You want 10 cylinders? Great. How would you like them? What kind of fuel would you like? Would you like it with or without turbocharging? Uh, 12 true. cylinders is, is a good one to do that with. Obviously, with, I mean, pretty much yeah. eight cylinders, right? Would you like them in a W or would you like them in a V? Mm-hmm. Would you like diesel or gas? You know. Would you like a flat six? A straight, no straight six is in the Volkswagen Group. That's true. But VR. there was a narrow, was a VR, a def- narrow a and a regular V. There yeah. was a v, regular V and a n- narrow V. And then a VR5 and a straight five. Right. Flat four in the PS era. I don't, 718 technically. Mm-hmm. Uh, flat four, straight it. four. Um, but no Lancia V4, type, no. Lancia type V4. No. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. You can get V10, 12, 16. You could do W12. You could do V12. V12. You could do uh, V12 diesel. Yeah. Um, there was, diesel. Yes. There's yeah. a lot of fun options really cool. during that era. And now they're just like, you get your, your choices are two f- liters, three liters, yeah, exactly. or four liters. But don't forget the one and a half liter turbo charge. Although the Volkswagen Group, I think, is a 1.2 three cylinder. Oh, um, the big one. <laughs> no, I refer to the uh, 670cc Citroën 2CV as the big block because no. the early ones were 400 something cc's. So the 600cc yeah. one is the big the, block. The big block. <laughs> big bore. Um, 
Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, the, the, the goal of an engine, is, an engine is an air pump, right? Yes, it is to transfer as much gases as possible. Sounds like me after... After Tuesday. lunch, after Taco oh. Tuesday, right. Uh, so uh, you could add a turbocharger to you to transfer more gases, or you could um, flow more. Uh, well, that's more mass, I guess. Well, and the, the whole idea is of, of those revs is that it's not only just the ability to breathe, but now by having two cams that are operating um, a certain number of valves, you're removing finger followers and other sort of complicated things in the valve train so that you can spin them faster. Right. So like I always found very interesting in uh, Dodge Neon 1994 era, um, you could get a Neon with a two liter, uh, two liter that was either an eight valve or a 16 valve. Um, and it, the horsepower was 132 or 150. Um, and that was the difference between going from a single cam to a double cam. Right. You could you can you can spin the twin cam and put more aggressive cams on 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 it such that you can make more power because there's a certain amount of power that you're never going to be able to exceed in any engine and naturally aspirated engine without doing revs, right? So what we talk about is this right. specific so, torque. Yeah, we should talk about revs in a moment as well. But let, no, 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 let's, let's finish this Shit. thread. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> bef yeah. no, before no. we talk about uh, RPM. Well, so basically what you, there a, a certain displacement of engine regardless of bore or stroke um, regardless of design will have a maximum amount of torque that it can produce at its peak and that's volumetric efficient efficiency how real effectively how much of those cylinder the cylinders can it fill properly to to the max um, and so for something like a two liter you're in the on the order of 150 pound feet of torque you're not going to get any better than that um, so if you know that horsepower is nothing more than a function of torque times rpm and your maximum torque is somewhere around 150 pound feet of torque no matter what you do the only way to make more power is to rev it faster right and so again um, moving more air, air fuel mixture exactly so if you have an engine that can only rev to 5,000 RPM, let's, let's call it 5,500 RPM, um, you're not going to make more than 150 horsepower out of two liters. Um, it just so happens using the units that we use, uh, you know, SAE horsepower and pound feet of torque, um, torque and RPM, in those two curves intersect at 5,252 RPM, 5,252. Um, so you know that a, a car making 150 pound feet of torque at 5,252 RPM is making 150 horsepower. Um, to get to that sort of magic 100 horsepower per liter mark, you're going to need to be able to maintain that 150 pound feet of torque to a much higher RPM. And to get to the 200 mark, you're in the 7,000s. Mm -hmm. um, so you will notice people who are inclined towards observing data that anytime a car has a specific output of 100 horsepower per liter, it's going to be a Revy naturally aspirated yeah. engine. If it's, it's not, if it's naturally aspirated, it's going to yeah. do at least 7,000 RPM right. in order to do that. Yeah, and you can do the math. I mean, 7,000, let me just think about this. At 150, uh, I'm sorry about pulling out a calculator, which I swore I was never going to do. Um, but 7,000 divided by 5,252 is 1.33 times 150 is 199.9. So 7,000 RPM at 150 pound-feet of torque is your 200 horsepower. So without revving to, to 7,000 RPM, you are just not going to be able to make 100, 100 horsepower, horsepower per liter. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, unless you force more air in there, i.e. increase volumetric efficiency above natural uh, atmospheric air by turbocharging yes. or supercharging. Correct. Um, or putting electric motors on it or whatever. But Right. All of these sort of cheats that we have now, but in terms of experience, and this is why everyone always fixates on naturally aspirated cars, uh, you know, you want that the uh, the naturally aspirated progression of, of your experience. So, you know, this is why McLaren F1, you know, has a 7,600 RPM redline. I don't know what it is of the... That's all it is? Yeah, it's surprisingly low. That's so funny. Or maybe me, that's thing, where the power peak is. That would make more sense. I thought that, I thought I could hit eight grand, but whatever. I mean, it's not it's, it's 10, surprising. 12, yes, 1, RPM, correct. right? Um, right. But in the day, I mean my 75 Ferrari is 7,700. And that's a two valve per cylinder engine, mm -hmm. um, twin cam. Mm -hmm. And so each each cam operates those valves directly. Whereas for example, my uh, M20 powered BMWs, the old BMWs, those are single cam um, and it uses rockers and you will break those rockers over 7,000 RPM. Um, 
But yeah, they, I mean, and that was a common thing in order to save money because this, you know, what is the downside of all this is that there's, it's more expensive to have these castings and more camshafts and all that stuff. And so if you look into like some of the multi-valve engines of the late eighties and early nineties, you'll see some kind of curious arrangements. Like you were saying a single overhead cam V6 with 24 valves, or there were 12 valve, a lot of 12 valve inline fours that were happening during this era because they were sort of saying that, Yes, we still need to have, for economic reasons, a single cam, but we're, let's at least add one valve to that, and so it's not a two-valve engine, and so it's this compromise that's not really optimized around driving experience or performance as much as it is like improving the efficiency somewhat without increasing cost too, too much. Right, and so every cam that you're driving also has an efficiency loss, right? So Correct. You're, you know, just first of all, like every- a compressor that you know, like a supercharger, it takes yep. X horsepower to run a supercharger, which is right. not something that we usually think about when we think about supercharging because you think of it as adding power, but because it is directly driven off of the engine some way, it's like adding an air conditioning compressor or power steering mm-hmm. pump or any other ancillary. It does require quite some huge. number. Yes, quite a, a, a you know it's a huge load on. Yeah, that. it could I be mean, fifty horsepower to drive a supercharger. I mean. The Ford Mustang, the Shelby GT500 supercharger co- costs 150 horsepower to, to run uh, it. To run, and that's a 760 horsepower engine. So it's really burning 900 horsepower worth of fuel and have experiencing the stress of nine. It's producing 900 ho- horsepower, but buck but 50 is right off yeah, the top of it. Yeah, it goes away um, immediately. Uh, yeah, but you would see in the 1990s, you'd also see all of a sudden 16 valves that would pop up, single cam 16 valve four cylinders that would pop up. And that was largely for emissions re- reasons. Um, when you have two valves, you there's no perfect center spot for a spark plug. And if you think about it, when an engine's running very quickly, there's a very short amount of time for that flame to propagate right from the spark plug all the way and burn the mixture completely. So it, Ideally, you want that spark plug perfectly in the middle of the combustion chamber. Um, And when you have four sort of symmetrical valves, you can put a spark plug right in the middle. So Suzuki, for example. Oh, with a two valve, I guess you'd have to get, yeah, you'd have to offset it so that you can increase the amount of area that's Mm -hmm. available for gas transit effectively. Um, yeah. And so you'd see all kinds of like Suzuki did a 16 valve samurai for, or I guess it was a sidekick at that point. Um, And they would gain. nominal amounts of horsepower or none at all but it was there for emissions reasons i suspect that's the real reason why honda went to um went to the the new v6 is just emissions reasons you can time things differently when you have independent controls of of stuff well yeah and that's the power also of direct injection as well you can time when the fuel goes in because when you're port injecting stuff the fuel just comes in with the air and that's kind of your only option yeah yeah and the problem with that is if you cut the if you cut uh, spark to one of those cylinders, for example, like so cylinder deactivation is another emissions trick and fuel economy trick that, that, that Honda does even on the, on the V6 is with a port injection car, you can't really shut down three of the cylinders fully without continuing to spark, spark that t- because there will be residual fuel that's sort of condensed on the intake tract and is coming in. And mm-hmm. now you have a lean burn condition. So you have not enough, uh, not enough fuel to fully combust and it'll actually spark spike some emissions like nox emissions will spike when when running right because uh, nox is a result of not having enough oxygen or is it correct not yeah it's a no lean mixture too much not enough fuel hmm. um so you'll see that direct injection cars can cut can cut throttle uh, or can cut power by just not firing the injector with no spike in emissions uh, so they can do things like the farts that you get on on, on upshifts by just inducing a misfire inducing a misfire in a port injection car necessarily means you're going to have some emissions um and you don't have to deal with that on a direct injection cars because if there's no fuel being direct and in, uh, directly injected in there there's no residual fuel dripping down the intake off the intake valve um so you can start to play more tricks and all of this is aimed at basically you know engineers of the earliest cars would be like it would be really great if we could flow more gases through this same area or we could control ignition or we could control fuel and and we have the ability to do that with the advent of technology and so people are you know sometimes some someone asked me why is a 917 
you know, even though it goes 240 miles an hour, not competitive as a Le Mans car today. And, you know, A, you would die driving it because it's a really <laughs> treacherous car to drive. But also, you know, Group C introduced fuel consumption limits. Uh, and so you start having to be a little more clever. And it's a reflection of the fact that with electronic ignition, you can really have a lot more flexibility compared to mechanical uh, injection, which, you know, gives you more control than carburetors. And so even though we have these sort of high horsepower scenarios from the past, the character of those engines is so, so different compared to now when you have this ability to fine tune, you know, whatever it is that you want, whether that's the timing of fueling or the amount of fueling or Mm -hmm. timing of ignition. uh, And, Then, of course, you think about electric vehicles, and you're like, all of this is a kludgy workaround compared to what you can do with um, electric motors. And it's in that some sense, electric cars represent the neck, and certainly interacting with the Rimats Nevera, I think both demonstrated this to demonstrated this to both of us, which is that, you know, as much as you you have this all the sophistication of gasoline powered cars nowadays to control all of these things, you still have only one power unit that is delivering power in some way that is limited by physics to each wheel, maybe if you have a four wheel drive mm-hmm. car, but certainly modulating you have to do in a sort of dumb way, which is applying brakes or some cleverness in your differential. I uh, mean, the amount of computing power that it that it takes to run and manage modern internal combustion engines is just if an alien fell down from you know from space and was like looking at these Rube Goldbergian contraptions that we have on all you know in these cars where they're their own power plant but their own emissions plant sort of like in this in this car um, and they have variable valve timing and they have you know all of these weird devices to physically move a camshaft and advance or retard it based based on uh, based on RPM and load, and it's all done with oil pressure. It's so unbelievably complicated. And what it's all doing is trying to increase the area under the curve of the torque curve, right? I mean, it's one thing to talk about a 917's peak power, Mm -hmm. but the way it delivered that power is not the same way um, as cars are today. So you look at, like, what makes a BMW M4... um, you know, competition so fast, right? And all of, like, S- everyone's talking S58. BMW's, you know, M engine is just the biggest over, B58 and S58 are overachievers. Well, the reason why is they're turbocharged. They have twin cam phasing. So they have two cams, four valves per cylinder, direct injection, um, tur- turbos. I and mean, they have like the recipe for everything with all of the best controls on them. And so they can make peak boost and therefore peak torque from basically idle to redline. Um, and then you combine that with an automatic transmission with very closely spaced ratios that doesn't really have to cut power much for very long on a shift. And you get these cars that can pull off 11 second quarter mile runs with power levels where they really shouldn't. Right. And so it leads everyone to say, oh, BMWs are overrated. Okay, I'm not sure I totally buy that whole thing. What they are is a reflection of a really well-engineered torque con- curve versus you know some turbo even or even worse a, a peaky naturally aspirated car from 30 years ago right i personally don't care I mean, I'd yes have, you know, that is a different philosophical right. question but the, but the reality is honda's move to that twin cam v6 really surprised me like i can't believe they're bothering to 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 make a to new another a, new internal combustion engine at this stage right. in the game yeah or, and v6 especially because everyone like you know I guess I should I should say I applaud it because I've always been a fan of Honda's engineering. Honda's always done really great things, but like I just had a Volvo XC90 recharge ultimate all wheel drive. Blah, 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 whatever. What and does all that mean? It's a Volvo XC90, which is their full size three row SUV with a two liter four cylinder with a turbocharger and a supercharger and direct injection and electric motors on it. Um, and it's this ridiculously complicated thing, but that's Volvo's engine. Uh, Volvo only makes a four cylinder now. They're all two liter four cylinders, and it's just a matter of how much other shit do you strap on it to make more power. Um, and that's where the industry is going, and I don't particularly care for it because I don't want my luxury car, and I think I can call it Volvo a luxury car, to sound like a friggin' Kia Sorento rental from 20 years ago. Well, ideally, it doesn't sound like anything at all. I mean, I think that's the standard of care for that category. It's certainly not an enthusiast-oriented... Then I would go electric and, and yes. at least give it response because the reality is if you get those all those ridiculous controls wrong where you're managing start-stop, cylinder deactivation, variable valve timing turbo wastegate, blow off pressure, all this other shit, plus electric motors and an automatic transmission at the same time, it fucks up. I mean, I pulled out into traffic in that thing and 
had a moment because it just was like, oh, I didn't think you wanted me to go now. So I was asleep and the car just didn't fucking move. Um, so in that sense, I have to applaud Honda for making a new V6 um, instead of just overcomplicating the fuck out of a four cylinder um, and trying to move larger cars. Um, but uh, I find that I find it really interesting that at this late stage, like Honda is going to make a new V6. Hmm, maybe there's hope. Yeah, but it's just interesting because you would expect a move like that. You know, you, it wouldn't surprise you to come from Lamborghini, for example, who's just introduced a new V12. Or shock. Porsche would continue to do, because they will continue to make manual transmissions now that they finally had their uh, 911R learning opportunity, shall we call it. Um, well, but Porsche is also pushing really hard for biofuels, right? So mm -hmm, Porsche is right. pushing hard for an exemption, low volume, vo low volume exemption to be able to make internal combustion engine vehicles for sale in Europe. Um, right. when run on biofuels. Um, I am shocked that Lamborghini made a new V12. Well, yeah. I don't entirely... Lamborghini probably hates me right now because of that last drag race video I did where I had a rental Huracan rear drive. But I I don't know if I 100% believe that that's a really new engine or if it's a different casting so that it, it can include some hybrid stuff in it. Because think about it this way. The original Lamborghini engine lasted 50 years. <laughs> the, the last one is 10 or 12. Like, do you really think they're going to invest in an all new V12? Or are they taking that combustion chamber design, maybe making a refinement or two, um, and then putting it in a, in a housing that allows... Well, you have to, I guess, dig into the data and find yeah. out. Or I, and it'll be easy enough to... Grill the engineers. Yeah. It'll be easy enough to figure it out in time. I mean, I haven't seen anything on it yet, but bore stroke will tell me everything I know. I mean, if the, if the old engine has the same bore and stroke and compression ratio as the new one, well, guess what? This is the, this is the thing that gets me all the time. I, I, people get so mad when people, when we say that the Alfa Romeo V6 isn't a Ferrari V8 and one of the listeners, people get very angry. One of our listeners wrote a, wrote a couple comments and sent a, a bunch of links to an interview with the engineer of the, uh, of the, the Alpha 2.9 V6. And he went on and on and on and ad nauseum about how it a hundred percent wasn't the Ferrari um, V8 with two cylinders lopped off on it. Of course, a 60 degree V6 is not going to be, it is a 90, although yes. a 90 degree V6 isn't going to be a, literally a V8 with where somebody jigsawed off two cylinders, right? It's going to have a different crankshaft. It's going to have different components Block. to it but when the combustion chamber design is the same and the valve train design is the same um that's all that really matters that's where the fundamental engineering goes into that combustion chamber it's the same fucking valves yeah <laughs> like if it's the same valves and it's the same valve train design it's the same engine um and so i kind of think lamborghini probably just be interesting to find out mm -hmm. We'll find out. I mean, now. we should always, uh, at this stage of the game, celebrate naturally aspirated V12. Is it naturally aspirated? It's I NA, it's yeah. Okay, good. It's NA hybrid. It's a six and a half liter. I, look, it's the, the right recipe, except it doesn't have a, a manual option, yeah. which leads me back to Gordon Murray's mm -hmm. T50 and T33. I mean, um, what modern car conversation doesn't as an enthusiast? Right. Um, <laughs> although, yeah, I, I'm a little bit less excited than about that engine that Cosworth it was Cosworth, yeah, it's Cosworth yes. uh, GMA motor because it sounds a little bit synthetic. I think we have we have stumbled on the world's most perfect V12 that's actually too perfect. Mm. Have you noticed that? No, I mean, I well, I feel that way about a lot of modern engines, mm -hmm. and so I didn't feel appreciably more like that than any other, I guess, modern engine. To me, because my standard is carbureted, yeah. you know, like we did the Lancia Stratos video, and that car, so much of its character is oh my God. from the carburetors that fucking it just no we'll, we'll come back to that video in a second but that the gordon murray v, v12 sounds almost synthesized mm -hmm. it's it's almost too perfect mm -hmm. i wish they would like somebody would just take a ball peen hammer and just make a little bit of a dent in one of the exhaust runners just to give it a little bit of of texture dirt and texture yeah um and, and that is the kind of engine that i'm generally drawn to is and but my standards are you know i judge cars based on I drudge automotive experiences based on probably something from the 1960s or 70s. and Your heyday. Yes. <laughs> when I was m at my most limber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's Stratos. Yes. That's a Ferrari Dino V6. I've still never driven a Dino. 
246. The, the Dino drives very differently from the Stratos. Okay. But same engine. Same engine. Same state of tune, same everything. Uh, the, so I think the exhaust design is a little bit different. It has a little bit of stuff in there to prevent the engine from ingesting uh, d- dust and water. So the intake routing is maybe a little different than the exhaust routing, maybe to clear some of the, f- the structural members of the mm-hmm. car. But fundamentally, yes, yeah, same engine. There's a five horsepower difference in their ratings, 190 versus 195 horsepower. Which is probably all bullshit anyway. Yes. Um, also, it's Italy. We're talking yes. about Italians. Um, that you guys at the end at the end we'll put in a, a, a title card with a link to his Stratus video because you guys gotta watch it. That thing is. What you, what what was the title of the episode? Is clinically insane or something? Yes, it um, is a clinically insane automobile. Mostly due to the overwhelming experience of engine plus a completely darty driveline. Yeah, chassis. The okay. chassis is really the part of the car that makes you fear for your life Mm -hmm. i I, it is a genuinely terrifying car like i i was almost wondered if something was wrong with it Mm -hmm. but i don't think anything was wrong Mm -hmm. with it because i didn't crash it but i I felt like i was on the edge the entire time you look like you were about to shit yourself yeah (laughs) i mean it's a really outrageous experience and there's so much variability between those cars i mean one of the reasons why they designed that car the way they did was with the adjustable suspension and uh access was in order to make it be a good rally car and so i i I think no two stratoses probably drive the same because there's so much adjustability in the suspension Mm -hmm. because they'll use a different setup for africa or you know acropolis which are both really rough events Mm -hmm. versus a more tarmac Tarmac oriented event Uh, and ever some drivers are like i want it really out unhinged Mm -hmm. you know and other people are like i would like to be able to keep it under control so there's so much variation and adjustability built into that car that you know when you drive your stratos you may not have the same experience (laughs) that i had but i think mine was a particularly unhinged example but i'm interested to see another one drive i I would i'm interested to drive one of them yeah um but that no the noise that that thing made yeah and you said in the video 7800 rpm mm-hmm. that's 100 more than the 308 yeah i mean this is the yeah. engine that your the 308 engine replaced this engine well so but the they're not related Don't yes forget. but in the terms two, of yeah. like what customer expectations yeah. were and what their product sort of uh ethos was it's similar that they should expect to sell a 7500 plus rpm engine in their base car to the public that's the craziest thing, right? So th- go back to 1970s for a second, right? You get late, ni- early 1970s, you have Ferraris that rev to, uh, to seven, seven and a half grand. And then- for, Yeah, the V12s, yeah, would be seven to 8,000, actually. The 275 GTB4 power peak was 8,000 RPM. That's n- and that was a street car. Yes, That's nominally. Right. Nominally. Um, but the sort of more civilized Ferraris were still 7,000 RPM. Yes, that's engines. right. The, the, but, the least thrilling engine you could buy in the late 60s from Ferrari was a 7,000 RPM power peak. Yeah, that's great. That was the flexible engine. And, and then the, the unflexible to, engine was 8,000 RPM power peak. And you peak. compare that to American stuff that was probably ever for. I mean, um, we had a 75 Chevy Impala wagon, same year as the My 308. Um, and its horsepower peak was 3,600 RPM. 400 cubic inch V8. So probably, I mean, didn't have a tack and I don't know, probably rev to 4,000 if you, if you could get it there. Um, you think the you transmission, I, you think the transmission wouldn't go any farther? Wouldn't let you go any farther? I don't know. I mean, it's not like it had a rev line. It was carbureted with just, you know, points on it. So uh, if the engine could rev that far, if the transmission would let it happen, maybe it could hit 4,000 RPM. Um, but the crazy thing is then it, you fast forward within 10 years and, and Toyota had 7,500 RPM, eight, did they do an 8,000? That 8,000 RPM, 5 valve. valve. Oh. Uh, they had 5 valve that was 8,000. That was a bit later. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it didn't take all that long before everyone caught on to if you put twice as many cams in it, you can drive the and valves the valve directly. To go with it. Yes. And that is a reflection of something that we, you know, everyone always talks about racing, improving the breed. And it's interesting to watch the tech this technology over the course of, or any technology that, not any, but a lot of car technology, whether that's relating to carburation or fuel injection or electronic fuel injection or valve trains, all of these sort of tricks that started, you know, maybe even in airplanes in some cases in the 40s for, for as far as fueling technology goes and in the apparently teens, as we learned in our 46 seconds of, uh, of research, <laughs> Uh, to drive uh, changes that we are still... I mean, because you can still buy, for example, a Corvette uh, with, with, push rods. with push rods, which is... Or a Hellcat Charger, you know. Why, uh, why are they still doing that? It works. 
The crazy thing is my favorite V8 at the moment is, is Chevy small block. I mean, it sounds amazing. It's small. You know, there's there's reason. There's also another reason why everyone is LS swapping everything, right? Right. It's I guess small, it solves the complaint you b- raised about the GMA Cosworth V12. There's actual texture and there's personality. Texture. But they're yeah, they all miss. They misfire at idle. I mean, they're just kind of rough and gruff. But really, what I love about that engine is the simplicity of it. Right. Mm-hmm. It's anytime you have a car, a car company specifically who has a sort of flawed design but sticks to it, they wind up stumbling on excellence. We've talked about this with Porsche. Yes, development. Just continually developing. You've developed anything long enough with enough talented engineers and you can really make it work. And I mean, the the 6.2 liter V8 in the the base Corvette Stingray, it makes great power. It makes great noise. They're very, very efficient. It sort of reminds me of the old GM 3800 V6 that that lasted 20 years past mm-hmm. its expiration this date. This is potentially its own episode, even. I, I feel like we could talk about a lot of flawed things that lasted forever, or like, you know, that some of the great engine designs of all time are like this, where they just they literally just make them for decades, yeah. you know. Just whether that's finish it The Bitsarini V12, or the LS, or Rover V8, mm-hmm. or Jaguar XK engine. I mean, all of these engines were around for decades. But did the Rover V8 ever really work, right? Yeah, they were pretty, I mean. Which was, so, by the way, a Buick V8. Let's yes, make that very clear. yes. The the uh, my mom had a Range Rover that she put one hundred and fifty thousand miles on. We never did touched the engine. That's true. I guess they did replace it with the AJV8, which had immediate timing chain issues. In so I the guess Range uh, in, in Range Rover, they went BMW for a hot second, for a while, which was a real disaster. And then, and then they then, went uh, yeah, Jaguar V8. Right. Um, so I guess compared to the later German, and, but that's the kind yeah. of problem where everyone's like, "Oh, it's got timing chain uh, tensioner problems." That's the kind of thing that you develop out. You know, like Rover V8s initially were very problematic because they had uh, their aluminum, and you had some, I think, c- differential expansion rate issues that led to cooling coolant going places where it wasn't supposed to go right. in the in the Buicks because you know that was really spicy stuff for GM to be making a non-cast iron engine in the early mid 60s right. so the you know, early ones had cooling issues and uh, had like probably sealing issues uh, but you know it's the kind of thing that right. gets engineered out if they right. continued to make Jaguar AJ V8s long enough I'm sure they would have figured them out we one would hope so <laughs> <laughs> the way that um, they did with any, you know any other engine anyway so I think that, that could be potentially an interesting topic someday topic is to talk about talk really about. long lifespan x or y's i mean they never got the the malzahn six and the bentley six and three quarterly liter v8 to really work well although they did re-engineer it at the end they're not long enough they're not old enough now to find out um, whether what they did was decent right. or not yeah. yeah um but it's it's interesting to watch that speed of progress that happened through the 80s with with valves and revs Mm -hmm. Um, I love how everything now, you know, oh, I was going to say a minute ago, you were saying about racing, improving the breed. I find it really interesting that we, there are so many technologies that wound up starting in F1 and racing that trickle down to road cars. Um, Kinetic energy recovery. I was actually going to say that hybrid hybridization and turbocharging are things that went the other way around. Yes. They were actually spurred like the the current crop of F1. Like I don't watch Formula One. (laughs) I do watch drive to survive on netflix because it's amazing um that's all i care about (laughs) um and i'm almost through um, i'm always almost to the second episode of last year's first of last season's first uh or whatever but the the point here is episode two of season five episode two of season five the my point though is i think you can really see the technologies that have started in racing and wound up becoming on road cars versus the ones that are put onto race cars because of the PR value Mm. um, of having them there. I don't agree. I don't think Formula One engine should be turbocharged little V6s with hybrid and all the uh, crap on it. Um, I think that's... I mean, it's really amazing to go back and listen to the F1 cars of even, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, mm-hmm. for example, just absolutely unreal stuff. Yeah. But you also, yeah, I mean, this was in, implicit, I guess, in the McLaren F1 to return to Gordon Murray for a moment. But, you know, he designed Formula One cars initially for uh, Brabham and then later on at McLaren. And he pioneered the use of composite monocoque mm-hmm. 
chassis, which, you know, made its way into the F1 road car. He wanted to do ceramic brakes in that car, but he couldn't get them to function. It was just slightly too early to get it to function in a street environment when they needed to work when they were cold and when they were wet and when they were this or that and not have them work the same effectively when they were cold versus not. Uh, and so, but, you know, he pioneered the use of carbon ceramic brakes in Formula One cars, which was something he got out of the Concorde, which I love. I love watching so the flow cool. from airplanes to Formula One to street to cars. Street car. It's yeah. like a, this sort of standard progression of technology yep. uh, so and hybrids and turbos did not do that yes they did not uh, they did turbochargers not. they did put in airplanes but sure. hybrid systems they did not right. um i mean regenerative <laughs> braking in an airplane braking in is, not, is not really <laughs> it stores all the kinetic energy and uses it to take off at the, after oh, the next. that's an interesting idea with airspeed um, no, i don't think that. i'm sure someone has thought about it but yeah turbocharging of course yeah. with airplanes makes a, a really a ton of sense because you're doing a lot of high uh right. altitude work. yeah but they don't piston engines when was the last time you were on a plane with a piston engine I mean, me personally or generally? Yeah, it's yeah, not well, a, the average person is not. In yeah, a, yeah, that's true. Right. That's true. I mean, but then they also tried to put turbines and everything in the 1960s, which didn't work out so well. Right. And they also tried to make nuclear powered everything in the 50s, which also didn't work out. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> there were <laughs> nuclear powered airplane yeah. concepts. That's so crazy. For but the Ameri- really crazy. For the Americans, they, the shielding requirements were much too great. But in the Soviet Union, they were like, nah, the crew's expendable. So they were like, we'll save weight on shielding. Uh, but the Americans quickly uh, realized that it was too heavy. Yeah. Anyway, that was neither here nor there. Uh, but but uh, it was episode number 90, whatever. Of one or two Show. of the Carmudgeon Show. Part of the Haggerty Podcast. Join us next week unless we have decided to fuck off. In which case, join us at some other time. Wow, that was... Uh a very sudden ending. Uh, more importantly, again, go watch Derek's video on uh, that Stratos because that was, it's quite a uh, roller coaster. It's a wild ride. I encourage everyone to interact with one as intimately as you possibly can. Somebody please deliver me a Stratos that I can drive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>